My name is Marcia Ostashevsky, and I'm the director of the Center for Sound Communities at Cape Breton University. Welcome everyone to the Center for Sound Communities very first, so it's our inaugural first ever Summer Institute workshop or course, and today's event focuses on Byzantine Ukrainian liturgical cantering, and it's led by Dr. Melanie Turgeon from King's University in Edmonton, Alberta. As we begin uh, today's workshop, I'd like to very gratefully acknowledge that the Center for Sound Communities is located in Unamagi, which is in Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq territory, the ancestral territory and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, uh, some of whom may join us today. Um, certainly, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, our dear friends and colleagues in Cape Breton, um, Darlene, who I was chatting with earlier, Stephanie, uh, Father Roman Dusanovsky. Hello, folks. Is anyone else here from Cape Breton? Or from I, Diane is here. Yes, okay, great. Um, and uh, I'd just like to uh, really say a, a heartfelt hello, really warm wishes to you all. Um, mostly don't due to COVID and a bunch of other kinds of strange things that have happened with scheduling in our lives. I haven't been in Cape Breton since the beginning of 2020, just before COVID. Um, and my dear friends uh, from Cape Breton, I miss them terribly. I'm used to singing with them every week, fe feeling them singing next to me and, um, I, I miss I miss their warmth, their camaraderie, and and most of all, I miss singing together. So I'm really glad that we could schedule this workshop. And Dr. Turgeon has uh, worked with me to prepare something that is uh, very much with them in mind, with the activities of the parish, but will be useful and informative for anyone who's joined, whether or not you're part of Ukrainian parishes or not. Um, so uh, I think many of you have seen the wonderful poster about today's event and uh, please remember that there is a second workshop next Thursday at the same time, same place. Um, there's a, a really uh, fine biography on that poster that tells us of Dr. Turgeon's education and of her professional work now at King's University, uh, her involvement with many choirs and um, her role as a cantor as well. Um, but I'd like to open today, if I may, with a, with a little story about uh, Dr. Turgeon by way of introduction, and I hope that will be okay, Melanie. Um, Depends which so, story. I'm working on. <laughs> so she and I both went to the same undergraduate program in music at the University of Alberta. Uh, but when I started, uh, I was the only person of Ukrainian ancestry in that program, aside from a graduate student who I saw occasionally who was a marimba player um, and ordered for his performances a special pur a purple thread embroidery um, shirt for his performances, Ukrainian embroidery. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but when I was graduating in my fourth year, that's when Melanie was beginning her undergrad. So we're not that many years apart and I'll say that when I heard about her and her friends who were singing, uh, there, there's a singing group called the Cherubime. Um, she leads that group. I mean, she, it really was an angelic voice for me to hear Ukrainian music in the halls and the practice rooms when before it really had been my own voice uh, singing these songs and these tunes. So um, it was a real grace, her presence for me. Uh, and um, one day I finally met her uh, and although, you know, I moved on to another school, uh, so we didn't have that much overlap, um, I, I haven't had until more recently the opportunity to let her know just how special her presence was for me. And uh, we've begun to reconnect and do research together and these workshops are a result of this reconnection. So uh, Father Roman Dusanovsky has been uh, teaching me, and so have all of the singers at the Holy Ghost Ukrainian Catholic Parish in Cape Breton. Um, and we've, they've been sharing their experiences singing in the parish. 
And on the basis of that, we've been publishing chapters. So uh, if you're interested in learning about um, some publications that have come out of our collaborative research, you can, you can let me know that. Um, or you can look on the Center for Sound Communities Facebook page, which has some postings about those publications. Um, but also, I've been connecting with, with Melanie, uh, and she researcher, researches and is a practitioner and it teaches about this music in, in different ways than I do. So I'm here as a learner today, uh, while also a host, um, and really grateful that you've been willing to schedule this time with us, Melanie. Uh, and on that note, I'd like you to, I'd like to welcome you to begin. And, and ask that everyone um, helps me welcome Melanie to begin today's workshop. And I look forward to spending this time together with you today and next week as well. Melanie? Thanks very much. Thank you for uh, such a beautiful intro. That's uh, a very warm way of uh, starting today's uh, presentation off. And I appreciate this time. I appreciate um, Marcia's hospitality and the entire welcome that I've received from the Center for Sound Communities. Um, do I uh, have the ability to uh, share my screen? I think I need to be made a, a co-host or something, right? Yes, I think you do. Let me check how I can make that. And while uh, Eric is figuring that out for us, I just wanted to say it's nice to see some faces that uh, I've seen in recent times. So uh, on June the 19th, the King's University gave a cantering workshop. And uh, that is where I met some of you who are on this uh, Zoom session right now. Um, so I, I welcome you back and I thank you for putting up with me a second time. And uh, I look forward to uh, getting to know the new faces in the, in the Hollywood squares in front of me. So uh, we'll take a moment for all of you to, uh, to introduce yourselves a little bit later. Um, but uh, just wanna say thank you for your presence today. And uh, I'll try my best not to uh, disappoint. I'll try my best to lead you as, uh, as uh, I'm, I'm able to, so. I still don't see anything yet, uh, Eric. Yeah, Melanie, I think yeah. that in order to make a co-host, that should uh, have happened before the, the meeting started. But I can make you a host, and you will be able to, to share anyway. Okay. I think we'll need her to press recording as well then. Is that correct? Oh, it's still uh, recording. It's still, it's still recording, recording, so maybe yeah. not. Okay, so it says you are the host now. That's awesome. Okay, so see if I can share my screen right now. Just give me a moment. Okay, this is always the funnest part of presenting because it's uh, not my forte to say the least. Okay, let's go over here. Um, let's, oops, that's not what I wanted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, come on, just wait. That is not at all what I wanted to do. Just give me a second here. Melanie, we're now seeing the title slide. Yeah, just wait. I was trying to get it into a presenter's view. So um, I don't know why it's kind of deserted me here. Just wait. Uh, and maybe I can switch it from one slide to the next. Let's see, can I use, oh, I guess maybe it's not the worst thing in the world. Okay, hold on. Let's try this again. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm trying to share the opening screen again. So hopefully you're at the right presentation, folks. That's all I got to say, because this is the title of it. Now's the time to bail in case this is not what you signed up for. Um, so we're going to be uh, talking about cantering, obviously, in the Byzantine uh, Ukrainian liturgy. And I uh, just simply titled it, Come Let Us Worship. And um, okay, so it's not letting me. Uh, advance the screens. Oh boy, just wait. I might need to just do this. Okay, just wait. It's the type of view I chose. Um, cancel. Okay, let's try this again. This is what I wanted to do. All right. So hopefully you can see. Um, is it really small or not? I can't see. I can't see the slide. You can't anymore. Okay, hold on. 
This is what I used last time and it thought it worked, but maybe not. Um, okay, maybe I have to go back into Zoom again. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Once we're rolling, we'll roll folks, I promise. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, can you see it as a big slide or just simply one in the tiny corner? I think we see what you see, which is a big okay. slide and then a little slide. Okay, so that's not the best. Let me try a different way to show this. Um, let's just do full screen maybe. Is that a little bit better? Okay, I think I got it now and I can use these arrow keys. Good. Let's try this for a bit, folks, and we'll see if I can maybe work with this. I'll know I'll need to get out of it here. So, so you should be looking at a quote uh, by Tchaikovsky right now. And uh, some of you have heard this before because I've shared it with some of you before. And I, I love um, a few things in this quote. I love the excitement that you can, um, you can perceive in it. And I love his reference to the senses. So the so many ways that we are captivated as uh, Eastern Christian worshipers, and I'll read it for you if you haven't already, it's impossible not to be profoundly moved by the liturgy of our own Orthodox Church. I also love Vespers, to stand on a Saturday evening in the twilight in some little country church filled with the smoke of incense, to lose oneself in the eternal questions whence, why, and whither to be startled from one's trance by a burst from the choir, to be carried away by the poetry of this music, to be thrilled with quiet rapture when the royal gates of the Iconostasis are flung open and the words ring out, praise the name of the Lord. All of this is infinitely precious to me, one of my deepest joys. And I don't think you'd be here if you didn't share something in common with this quote, um, that excitement and that dedication to your worship and that desire to know more and to, to learn. Um, so I really uh, thank you for your presence today. And I hope that we can tap into some of these things that he refers to and uh, just deepen our knowledge together. So what are some of my goals for today? Well, um, to worship with greater understanding and appreciation. I hope that I'm able to share um, just a little bit of a reflection on the various parts of the, of the Divine Liturgy um, to get a sense of how it's kind of uh, uh, its place in terms of the other services that exist. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it's compartments, so to speak, it's, it's how it's uh, portioned off and stuff and, and to bring some deeper understanding there. I hope to sing some alternate versions of various parts of the liturgy with you over the next uh, couple of weeks here this Thursday and next Thursday. And maybe it'll yield more musical variety in our parishes because you won't be scared to try them on your own. So you uh, would have been emailed um, a little booklet of music. Uh, something like 10, 10, 12 pages, something like that. And we'll use that today um, to sing from. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to print it or anything like that, I'll try my best to bring it up on my screen so that you can just simply read it off the computer screen as well. Um, I have the pleasure of serving on a liturgical commission for the Eparchy of Edmonton. And right now we're in the process of trying to standardize the music in English and Ukrainian for the Divine Liturgy first, and then we're moving on to other services. And what I mean by that is, um, as you know, and we all know that there's been music in existence for the Ukrainian parts of the Divine Liturgy for a long time. And it's my sense, and maybe you have a different sense of this, that just over time, parishes have kind of figured out how to sing things in English and have ran with that. Uh, is it the best way to sing it? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, and we're trying to very thoughtfully uh, put that together. And I realized that the anthology uh, has been in existence and has done a wonderful job in um, exposing us to English ways, like English text uh, with the Divine Liturgy and how to sing those different sections of the, of the liturgy. And our, um, our role, I guess, in the Upper Key of Edmonton is to create bilingual resources. Um, 
a music that also just is very closely linked to the original Ukrainian music. So I'm part of that uh, initiative, that movement, and obviously I'm going to share some of those uh, uh, findings with you over the course of these next uh, two sessions together. I, I hope that um, our time together that we um, are able to just identify with each other, uh, having similar interests and to build community, and that we become encouragements and, and resources for each other, that we're able to help, and that this is a networking opportunity for, for all of you. Um, I was very uplifted in June when I just taught this last cantering workshop that many of you were at, that many people put their, their names forward as mentors for others. Because as you know, with cantering, that's a huge part of it. You need that person uh, to lead you through. And for me, it was Sister Rose um, in Edmonton. And I'm very grateful to her that she was my source of inspiration and the person that just said, go for it, try it, you'll be fine. You'll, you know, and I was able to sing things for her. I just wanna take a, a quick mo moment to introduce myself and then we'll, introduce ourselves very quickly. So um, Marcia kind of alluded to uh, my young start. Uh, I started conducting already at age 16 and I had the pleasure of uh, learning from who, the person who was the conductor of the Cave State Opera and Ballet Theatre and that was a guy by the name of Volodymyr Kolesnik. And I went on from there and got a Bachelor of Music um, pardon me, a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Alberta majoring in music. And then I went on to do a master's yet at the University of Alberta. And then I went on to the University of Illinois to get a doctorate in uh, choral music from there. And that was a, a good time uh, in terms of um, moving away from Edmonton uh, for a short time. And um, I was uh, newly married and it kind of was the right time to, to, to move on and to have new experiences. Um, I've been really fortunate in that I've uh, been on tour three times uh, in Europe with my choirs, so that's been a great experience for me. Um, as mentioned, I serve on a, on a liturgical commission and in Edmonton, and, and we're really trying our best to educate cantors and to create resources for cantors. And probably um, one of the biggest publications that came out of that initiative was the hymnal that uh, we created in 2008 yet. Uh, and it's a huge um, hymnal. It's called Spivaita uh, Bohovinashmo, or Sing to Our God. And maybe many of you are familiar with this resource. It's, um, it's in parishes worldwide, which is quite astonishing. Um, there's uh, parishes in Europe have it, parishes in, in Japan have it, if you can believe. And I think there's 40 places in, in the US uh, that have it and throughout Canada. So it well, obviously was worth all the work that we put into it. I used to serve as the con con conductor and cantor at St. Joseph's Ukrainian Catholic Parish in Edmonton. And um, right now I'm busy as a prof at the King's University, as Marcia mentioned. I still sing with Hiruvema Ukrainian Female Quartet. Uh, we've done three recordings together, but mostly now we're all very busy with our families and stuff. And uh, we just pretty much get together for weddings and funerals uh, to canter for those together. Um, and then I, in 2010, I founded a chamber choir called Capella Curie. And uh, we've been very fortunate to uh, win some nat national competitions. And I'm also very involved with something called the Ukrainian Art Song Project. But my biggest claim to fame is my family. And uh, I love them dearly. And that's why I included a picture of them. So Mark and I are blessed with two adopted children. Uh, we have Sophia, who's uh, special needs. She is uh, 12 years old right now, soon to be 13, but she's been acting like a teenager for a long time, even despite her disability. And uh, she's a wonderful, uh, wonderful gift to our family. And then we have little Joseph there, uh, who's three and a half. So I am very blessed uh, to have two wonderful children uh, with Mark by means of adoption. Now, I just want to, before we move on uh, to talking about some of these senses that Tchaikovsky alluded to, can you just take a moment to at least just tell us who you are and where you're from? Because I think that's really important that we see um, you know, where this, uh, like the outreach of this initiative that the Center for Sound Communities has put out. And I always like to be reminded um, of the names of those who I recently met at that June course. Uh, so please just take a moment. I'm going to just do it on my screen, if that's all right with you, so that I can 
uh, I can just like say the name of, of who I see on the screen next. So obviously you've met Marcia. Um, let's see if I can get the names to appear here. Oh, I can't in this type of a, uh, I don't know, Marcia, do you, can you see names on your screen? Do you mind just going sure. down the list yeah. and just asking that next so, person? Because so I'm in a view that I can't see it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I said, I'm the Center for Sound Communities Director at Cape Breton University, and uh, please connect with us on Facebook and have a look at our website to learn about different programming that you can get involved in, even if you don't live anywhere near Cape Breton, which is on the east coast of Canada, just above Maine, if you're in the United States. Uh, we are a social innovation lab and our work is arts based. So what this means in a nutshell is we work with communities to carry out research with them. Much of it is arts based, but isn't always about art um, and to solve real problems and challenges that the communities are faced with or dealing with or interests that they, they need to serve. Um, and I grew up on the farms in Northeastern Alberta in the middle of the biggest um, settlement of Ukrainians outside Ukraine. Uh, I've lived on uh, in every region of the country and on islands off both ends um and uh in cape breton now since 2013 and uh been doing research there since 2008 when i first met father roman who is uh one of the most joyful beings i'm sure this universe has ever seen <laughs> so um happy to call it home so um uh i'm gonna go uh, below on my screen which is june ivanitska Hi, I yeah, I'm I'm June. Um, you know, I grew up um, in a rural uh, southwest of Edmonton, uh, rural community, and um, I was uh, brought up in the Divine Liturgy. But then when I went, uh, you know, when I moved, uh, uh, went to university and came into Edmonton and stuff, I just sort of went in all different directions, and um, um, I kind of left that behind. And uh, thanks to the pandemic. <laughs> I rediscovered it uh, because um, St. Josephat's live streams all their liturgies and um, it's kind of been reawakened in me. So basically, I'm not a cantor. I do sing in the in the Roman Catholic Church, but but uh, but uh, it's kind of re reawakened uh, in me a great interest in the divine liturgy and cantoring. And um, so I'm pretty much just an observer. <laughs> I'm just, you know, with eyes and ears open, just hoping to learn some things. So. I, I probably don't have that much to offer, but I am very, very curious to, to learn more. So thank you for including me. Thank you very much. Welcome, you're, June. Wonderful. You're in Edmonton now, June, right? I am in, yeah, I live in Edmonton. Wonderful. Yeah. Jason Gulenchen. Yeah, my name is Jason Gulenchen. You got that right. <laughs> I'm from uh, Ukrainian Catholic Parish of the Resurrection in Dauphin, Manitoba. Okay. I've been in the area for most of my life. I did go to school in Calgary at Alberta College of Art and Design for four years. And um, I do have a lot more experience probably with Ukrainian dancing than I do with actually cantering. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I started probably about 10 or 11 years ago in our church uh, just to learn with the choir. And then when I wound up um, getting pushed on to the, go oh, your turn to go to canter, and I was kind of given the, the reins for a little bit of it. Uh, it's stress when you start out, but now I'm doing it for a bunch of other parishes, like smaller ones, like we have Sifton and we have um, um, Kel, there's tiny, tiny parishes with maybe 10, 15, 20 people there, but there's a lot of history behind them. They've been there for over hundred years. And um, yeah, and, and, and I'm on my own now. I have to do Easter, I have to do uh, Christmases, I have to do uh, weddings. And so a lot of times I'm digging for the information to find out how to do them. Uh, especially uh, difficult has been Holy Week to learn all of the different services. Um, but thank goodness I have the books to follow through and I have some music training. So I have about seven or eight years of a Royal Conservatory of piano. So at least, and I have a little bit of theory so I can read it, I can learn. And I, I, it's not as crippling as to someone who has no musical background. So um, that's where I'm coming from. Thank you, Jason. Stephanie Sauka. Hello, my name is Stephanie. Hi, Marcia. Um, I grew up in Sydney and have gone to Holy Ghost Parish my whole life, except when I moved away to go to university. So now I'm back and we sing a little bit on Sunday and I'm here to learn whatever I can. Awesome. 
Really nice to see you, Stephanie. Thank you. you. In person soon. Sing with you, <laughs> I hope. Darka Chandan. Hello, everyone. My name is Darka, and I am born and bred and still live in Toronto. Uh, I've been a choral singer for over 50 years, hmm. probably longer than some of you have been alive, and uh, started uh, started singing with our uh, church, uh, St. Demetrius, the, the great martyr, uh, Ukrainian Catholic Church here in Toronto. Um, I sang with the church choir for about 20 years. And about three years ago, I started uh, uh, assisting with cantoring and doing it intermittently through uh, COVID, according to our uh, ability to come in and sing in the church. And just as a sidebar, uh, Melanie, I attended the first conducting course with uh, Maestro Kolasnik in wow. Ancaster, Ontario, which yeah. really dates me. So, <laughs> but it's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Cristina Yermijo. Hello, everyone. I also went, well, I went to, I attended uh, Melanie's June class and it was wonderful. And I'm inspired to continue learning as much as I can. I canter at uh, St. Constantine Ukrainian Catholic Church with another a master canter. So I'm learning from him. I canter on Saturdays with him in English and then Sunday the, the choir sings in Ukrainian. So I kind of get both. And I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota and uh, there's not many of us here who canter and I just love it. And I'm not very good yet, but I'm getting braver. So those notes that we received from the previous workshop really helped me those little shortcuts. I have them with me all the time. So getting better. I'm mm -hmm. looking forward to this as well. Thank you. Awesome. Welcome, welcome. Thanks. Orisia Zaporizan. Hi, um, I am from Ottawa, uh, but my family is in Winnipeg and I'm originally from Winnipeg. So I have a connection, with the community there still too. I'm not a cantor, but I do like to help when needed. And I just like to have as much knowledge as I can about all this. I think it's really important, um, particularly in the Ukrainian language. Yep, that's it. And where are you from? What did I say? I missed that. Sorry, or maybe you uh, uh, Ottawa. Ottawa. Okay. Yep. Matthew Daniel Stremba. Well, I was glad to see uh, or to hear uh, there was a person from the States. I was afraid I was the only one. <laughs> Greetings to all you Canadians. Listen, I, I might, I'm probably the oldest guy here. Uh, <laughs> I have not cantered since we were all singing in Old Church Slavonic. Wow. I came within a year of being ordained a priest in the Philadelphia Arch Eparchy, and I, I chose to withdraw. And since then, uh, the distance between me and the UGCC has grown and grown. And so, my recent experiences with the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church has been pretty much on the internet. I even streamed the Holy Week services from the cathedrals in Western Ukraine, which was, well, that was quite an experience. But I gotta say, I gotta say, I miss Old Church Slavonic. So when I visit my sister, who is a nun at the St. Basil Con Convent in Fox Chase, Pennsylvania, and they sing Christos Voskres in Ukrainian, I'm always lost. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm curious to see what's going on. I came across you quite by accident. There was some kind of a website called uh, uh, SingCon, UGCC Music, and, and you were listed on there. Uh, so that's how I stumbled in. I so was listed, Matthew? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Oh, never heard of it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with us. I have been wondering how everyone's heard about the workshop. So it's great to know. Do continue to share the news of our events, please. Um, and a special welcome to our, for, to our friends and colleagues south of the 49th. Um, uh, Pani Korpetsky. Um, um, I'm from Victoria, British Columbia, and uh, 
uh, we're a very active parish and I'm trying to pass on the knowledge that I have. I've, I'm a, a retired Naval officer's wife and have to tell you that I spent time in Halifax many in the 60s and the 70s and there was no Ukrainian connection at all there. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that um, things are happening. I also belong to a um, uh, Ukrainian uh, women's ensemble, Luna, and we sing um, uh, Ukrainian music and, and some church music as well, in, if it's needed. Um, I, I attended um, Melanie's uh, June course and I really enjoyed it. I like to be connected. We're mm -hmm. so far apart and I'm so glad we're coast to coast. <laughs> It is really special. Yes, thank you. Darlene Baggio. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Darlene. I live in Cape Breton. Uh, Marcia has taught us a lot for the time that she's been here. My father is uh, Ukrainian. My mother is English, but uh, she took the task of learning as much as she can about our religion and our customs. And she made sure that we were brought up in, in that right, and I'm so grateful for that because <clears throat> the Ukrainian liturgy is just so it makes you feel like you're you're someplace else when when they're singing. I I just love it, and I hope that in the future our parish will continue to go on because we are getting very small in number. Mm -hmm. So glad you can join us, Darlene. It's and looking forward to singing with you again soon too. Teresa must leave it. Hello. Um, I want to echo the praise of Melanie's June event. I did uh, uh, also participate in that. Um, I am from Toronto, and uh, just like Darka Khandon, except the other way around, uh, I sang with the Kurelos Cantoring at St. Demetrius. The, great martyr. And then I joined the choir with her. Uh, I also sing in the choir of uh, St. Nicholas Church and had the pleasure of traveling to Ukraine just before the COVID uh, last January for the uh, Christmas Carol Fest, International, uh, International Christmas Carol Festival there. And we did sing uh, a liturgy. So that was a big high point for me. Um, my husband is Pravoslavny, so I also go to the Orthodox Church as well. And I was brought uh, up at in the Church of Our Holy Protection. And I have a small connection to Father Dusanovsky, Privit to you. Um, father's uh, late father and my late father both worked at Dempster's Bread together. Um, so Privit Oce, thank you for having me. Privit. So now, um, I think uh, uh, you all uh, briefly said hello to Eric at the beginning when you signed in. He's a graduate student at the Univer uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland. Hi, Eric. Uh, he's originally from Brazil, but he's studying ethnomusicology at Memorial University of Newfoundland. So thank you, Eric, for helping to support today's event. And our uh, the last uh, workshop participant is Father Roman Dusanovsky. Uh, before coming to me, there is Diane Jameson with Steffi Sauka. She's not registered separately, ah. but she may want to say hello. Please do. Hello, this is Diane. He's shy. <laughs> Okay, well, my name is Roman Dusanowski. I'm the priest here in uh, Sydney, Nova Scotia. I've been blessed to be taken under the wing of the cantor in my home parish when I was 10 years old. So I was taught cantoring in Church Slavonic and then uh, in Ukrainian. And I've been cantoring and singing in church ever since. Um, I, I taught cantoring in the seminary, both in Rome and in, um, in Ottawa. And I enjoy being, I enjoy more being with the Kirillos 
than I do with the altar. So I'm not sure what that says about me. But anyways, I, I'm looking forward to this workshop. I think it's not so much about what it says about you, but we're just really cool, Father Roman. <laughs> like, yeah. so let's just admit that. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Matt. And, and just uh, sort of to finish, right now I'm in the midst of passing three kidney stones, so <laughs> I'm doped up and happy. So uh, I should be—I'll yeah. be enjoying myself thoroughly. Thank you. Wonderful to have you, Father Roman. Well, folks, um, I appreciate you taking the time to introduce yourself because, like I said, that's very important that we realize that we're part of an entity. We're part of a group supporting each other. Um, and uh, I think that at that time is extremely well spent because I want you to feel welcome. I want you to help us lead this session and the next one from the perspective that if you have questions, please don't hesitate to unmute yourselves and ask. Um, uh, I, Eric asked me to give a very clear description of exactly what I was going to cover in the first half of this course and in the second half. And I said, Eric, I really want um, all of you to set that pace with me so that I don't you know, take it too quick, too slow. Uh, please be expressive. Uh, don't hold back. So as you know, um, we don't have white walls in our churches. We are uh, a church that is very much alive and a, a church that really appeals to our senses. So in terms of sight, the English word icon is derived from the Greek word ikona, which means image or likeness or representation. In a religious context, icons are images or representations of holy people and sacred events. And icons are symbolic and they follow a prescribed methodology. In terms, also in terms of sight, the iconostas, an icon screen, separates the altar area, the sanctuary, from the section where the congregation stands or the nave. Um, sight is huge for us, right? There's so much going on. And uh, right now, I'm uh, part of a parish here in Edmonton called St. George Ukrainian Catholic uh, Parish. And um, boy, is there a church that, I don't think there's a church that's more covered in icons. And if you ever have a chance to come to Edmonton, please take a moment to check out St. George because um, it's a wonderful parish. I'm, I'm going there because my brother-in-law is the priest right now. So we've made a little bit of a shift from the cathedral about 10 blocks north to go to St. George at the moment. Um, but with respect to icons, it's outstanding. Smell, obviously there's numerous candles that exist, mostly beeswax, incense, that beautiful um, uh, section from Psalm 141, let my prayer arise before thee as incense, that the lifting up of my hands be an evening sacrifice. Obviously, use of incense is quite significant in our right oil. So aromatic oils for special services, mostly healing services. Plus, we are anointed with oil on major feast days like Easter and Christmas with that reference to Psalm 23. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. With respect to um, taste, obviously communion is the biggest part of that. The bread and wine are consecrated into the body and blood of Christ, and we partake of that banquet. Often during the liturgical year, various foods are brought to church to be blessed. The most elaborate display of this is at Easter time. Another example includes the Feast of Transfiguration, which is coming up pretty fast where fruits are blessed, especially grapes, because they are symbolic of that perpetual new transfiguration of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Touch. Uh, we make the sign of the cross so often, right? We touch ourselves in that sign of, um, of the cross. We venerate icons in the gospel book with a kiss, not so much lately because of COVID, um, but we are, um, obviously that is a very big part of our right. We are often anointed with oil, um, as I mentioned, with respect to the smell, but also with touch. And chrismation is filled with touch, right? Whether it's an infant or an adult, you are touched, you know, and, and anointed with that beautiful oil on your forehead, your ears, and uh, all the different uh, parts of that beautiful chrismation service. Now, sound is what brings us here together. And 
as we know, only the human voice is heard and worshipped, and there is no instruments used in Eastern churches. The only instrumental sound you may hear is bells, either chiming from an outdoor bell tower or those handheld bells often used in church for various times within the liturgical year, such as the Paschal season. So the wonderful bells that are handheld that we ring during uh, Christos Voskres, uh, during Easter. Absolutely everything is sung. So apart from the sermon or the homily and the recitation of the prayer immediately before communion, everything is sung in our right. And I realize that uh, parishes make accommodations, right? We have maybe a spoken service, maybe in, in the mornings on a daily basis or partially spoken or Saturday evenings. But uh, the, the goal is um, for everything to be sung. And, you know, and I'm a, a cantor who believes that it should not take that much longer if we're doing our job correctly for it to be a completely sung liturgy as opposed to a spoken liturgy. Um, even the epistle or gospel readings are chanted, plus in some churches, in order for there not to be silence while the cantor takes a breath, often drones are held to give a perpetual kind of oral blanket of sound. Um, maybe that's something that is not used ever in your church. We're starting to do that once in a while at St. Joseph Cathedral here in Edmonton, especially uh, when we have irmose, uh, to, um, and often we'll have a soloist take that irmos, and the rest of us will hold a drone. I often do that with our choir. Uh, when I was still conducting the St. Joseph Cathedral Choir, um, the Irmos is so complicated. And that's a nice way to involve your entire Krelos by having them hold a drone during that entire time and to have a soloist uh, just sing the Irmos and, um, and for you to eventually unite on that final pitch. Um, so that's often how you choose the note of the drone. Um, it's often the one that could be um, uh, the one that it starts on and ends on so that they're not having to migrate much because that becomes very challenging with the choir uh, unless it's you know a professional choir or something then they work towards that so our a cappella singing our unaccompanied singing with no instruments whatsoever takes two forms in our church so either a cantor or a krilos can lead the congregation in the singing of a service and this is referred to as samoyo which basically just translates simple singing or a choir can sing works by various composers and the repertoire can be of uh, di can be differing in style and it can come from a variety of time periods and some of you alluded to that that you have exposure um, in uh choral settings as well that you're you know maybe a cantor um, within your parish and or you are part of a, a larger entity that might be uh, considered a krilos which is a small group of singers put together and then technically the definition of a choir is once there is three per voice part or more that's usually where we say okay this is considered a choir that you have three sopranos three tenors and some parishes might say I never have three tenors I don't think God created created three tenors, um, right? Because tenors are like finding a needle in a haystack sometimes. Uh, they're, I don't know, I, I don't know why the Lord did not create more tenors in this world, because I think that there's a need in every parish for more tenors. And um, let's, I don't know, we'll see what we can do to change that over time. I'm not too sure. So the services that we are uh, exposed to, um, some are very common to us and others maybe not at all. Uh, like in, I, I, I like to make comparisons often to the Western church because it's something that's, you know, kind of sometimes easy to draw parallels uh, to and with. So like Western churches, Byzantine faiths also have what we call divine offices. So the divine offices consist of several services celebrated throughout a 24 hour period. And usually only in monasteries and at some cathedrals are all these services conducted on a daily basis. Now, what do they include? And, you know, some of us might look at this list and say, wow, I only know one or two and that's it, you know, and some of us may say, oh, yeah, I've been there, done that, done them all, right? Um, some of these are very foreign to us. And the, the it bracketed uh, time is 
an estimation, right? Because every parish is different. Every parish kind of figures out how it works best. And, and I shouldn't even say parish. It's mostly in monasteries that all of this would be included. But it's important for us to just simply identify these. So obviously, we have Vespers. And even Vespers, um, some parishes are, are, are celebrating Vespers Saturday evenings. Um, you know, usually, yes, at sunset, depending on obviously on the time of year and where you live, sunset sometimes doesn't even exist for some people like now. Um, it's it's uh, like in Alberta right now, it's light till now it's starting to get a little bit darker around 11. But um, for Canada Day, fireworks at 11, it was still pretty bright when they let those fireworks go, but they didn't want it to be any dark later for families and stuff. So sunset take that with a grain of salt is what i mean um complines uh complines um we hear of them more so maybe during holy week we hear of the complines midnight office um, matins before sunrise obviously some parishes like at the parish uh that i'm most familiar with here in edmonton uh father peter uh, babe has reintroduced matins every sunday morning he does them um, mostly just with, you know, a handful of people who are come that early of the first hour, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and then obviously the one that we are all very familiar with, the Divine Liturgy. Now, the Divine Liturgy is what brings us kind of together today, and it's definitely like in the Western Church, the Mass is their central service for us Eastern Christians, the Divine Liturgy is our central service, right? Now, the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom Chrys uh, is not on its own, right? We are likely aware that that is definitely the most common and the most frequently celebrated liturgy in our right is the Divine Liturgy of, of St. John. But we should also be aware as cantors, especially that the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil the Great uh, is uh, replaces the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom 10 times during the liturgical year. And then we also have the Divine Liturgy of, or, or pardon me, the Liturgy of Pre-Sanctified Gifts, which is celebrated on our Wednesdays and Fridays of Great Lent, and then the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of Holy Week. Now, just for some church trivia and to uh, let you uh, speak out and answer some questions. Let's brainstorm together and just identify when is the Liturgy of St. Basil celebrated? When are we familiar with uh, its existence in our liturgical year? Like when do we hear? We, we have 10 oh, times. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not fair. <laughs> Anybody, I guess you'll have to answer. Sorry. Anybody want to speak out? Go for it. Lent? You betcha. Oh. Lent. Uh, Sunday. Of Sundays. Lent. Sundays, yes. Sundays in Lent. Yeah. Specifically Sundays. That's a, a wonderful uh, addition there to say the Sundays of Great Lent should be the liturgy of St. Basil the Great. Any other times that we can think of? January 1st, St. Basil's betcha. Day. Yeah, so don't drink too much on the 31st because it's a longer liturgy on the first folks, right? So the Feast of St. Basil, right, on January 1st, New Year's Day, absolutely, we celebrate the liturgy of St. Basil the Great. Holy Thursday. Holy Thursday, you betcha. So Holy Thursday, um, for us here in Edmonton at the Parish I-10, usually we do it in the morning, and then it's uh, combined with some sort of, a, um, you know, a, uh, anointing service thereafter and stuff like that. Uh, there should be one more big one that we uh, are missing yet. Very Holy close Saturday. There. Holy Saturday, absolutely. So the Holy Thursday, Holy Saturday, throughout Great Lent, and then on the Feast of St. Basil the Great. I think we got them all. But the St. Basil's on Holy Thursday and Holy Saturday are combined with Vespers. Yes. So yeah. they're not, it's a truncated, uh, service yeah. gets a combination of both. It starts as Vespers and then kind of transitions into the liturgy. Yeah, yeah, very, very wonderful observation for us. Thank you so much, Father Roman. Anything else that people want to add before we go on or any questions that you might have? Liturgy of Pre-Sanctified is also called Liturgy of St. Gregory. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Please so share. Why is that, Father Roman? He's the uh, prescribed 
author of it, St. Gregory Palamas. Oh, wonderful. That's new to me. That's, that's awesome to know. I also found a liturgy of St. James on YouTube that I was watching for a little while. Um, can't tell you a whole lot more about it because I just quickly started watching it and then departed from it. But um, if anybody has some information, please share. I'd also like to give a shout out to Maurice Brigadier who has joined us from Cape Breton. Hi, C. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, like I said, feel free at any point to just stop with questions or comments or observations, additions. Um, like the Mass in the Western Church, the Divine Liturgy con consists of two main sections, what we call the ordinary and the proper. So the ordinary portions of the Divine Liturgy are the ones that re remain exactly the same every time the liturgy is celebrated. So it is these sections that composers usually have made countless contributions to um, because composers know that they get more playing time, right? So if they write a Sviate Borgia, for example, or a Ochenash, then they know that that technically is celebrated each time the Divine Liturgy um, happens. So you would hope that it would be um, chosen more often, right? So if they wrote, let's say, some music to a changeable part that you maybe only have maybe once or twice a year, um, then that's not as, uh, you know, it's not as much opportunity there for them. So we have what we call the ordinary, uh, what's changed, what stays exactly the same always with the liturgy, and then we have the proper. And the proper are what we call our changeable parts. Now, I want to take uh, just a, a brief listening break at this time, um, just to kind of um, make us realize that, you know, there are these two forms of worship uh, in terms of, yes, we can be a cantor, uh, an individual person um, leading a congregation, or we can be part of a choir. Uh, and and this is, you know, that four, hopefully that four part harmony that these Ukrainian composers have contributed to. And I'm sharing Ukrainian and, and you'll see non-Ukrainian very, very shortly. So, you know, some of us might be aware of names like Stetsenko or Burnyansky or Berezovsky or Vedel and all those wonderful Ukrainian composers who have made countless contributions uh, to the Divine Liturgy. And then in more recent years, thankfully, we have people like Roman Hurko, who is a Canadian born um, composer who now resides in, in New York. And Roman has uh, been very prolific lately uh, with choral music and he has, you know, uh, divine liturgies and all kinds of stuff, uh, Vespers, which you'll hear an excerpt from there. And then this last composer we'll talk about once we get there. Now, the thing that I hope is that I hope I'm able to get out of this, just wait to, um, uh, let me just stop sharing for a moment so that I can hopefully get to these examples. And then I have to figure out how to share my sound. That's the biggest thing. Um, I haven't had anything come up yet to ask me if I wanna share my sound. So let me try, see how it works. And I, and I apologize for uh, not being the most... Um, uh, Melanie, if I'm not mistaken, when you, when you have the option to share the screen, uh, yep. there's a oh, there's box that you can share click sound. share sound yeah now i found it thanks okay. eric okay now i want to go to chrome and i think that's this if i'm not mistaken okay just hold on we're getting there all right so here's our first excerpt this is stetsenko's um Svete Bozhe from his divine liturgy
So one of the things I love about that um, version of Siete Boche is the texture changes that uh, Stitsenko puts in for every single verse. It's not the same. The, the, the text repeats itself, but he puts different voice parts together to bring that variety to show that the Trinity is um, one entity, but so uh, different in each of those verses and stuff. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful composition. Now I'm going to share Roman Hurko's uh, Vespers excerpt. So this would be um, uh, a choir from Ukraine singing this Vidubitsi, so you might be familiar with them. Want to know how to get rid of sorry about that i thought i could stop it before we got into that now this last one is um thankfully we have also you know not only people like roman Hurko, but recently i came across a wonderful american composer and i'm glad we have some people from the states with us today uh because maybe you are familiar with kurt sander now kurt sander is a, an orthodox uh, christian he's part of the orthodox church of america and um, he's written an outstanding divine liturgy that was nominated for a Grammy Award, if you can believe. Uh, this that I'm gonna play you is not from that divine liturgy, but this is um, a, a piece that is part of um, one of the three liturgies that we just talked about. And I'll let you uh, decide where it's from. It's a little bit of trivia as well. So this is uh, one of the groups I conduct and uh, this is us singing Kurt Sanders. Um, selection and, and the title will come up for you as well here.
just join it. Get out of this full view here. What liturgy was that text from? St. Basil's. Yeah, you betcha. Let me just try to get back here to where I need to go. So I seem to get to my... And what part of the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil is it from? Which section, like what part of the liturgy? Can I go again? Sure. <laughs> it's the Irmos. Yeah, so it's the Zamis de Stoina or the Irmos, the hymn to the mother of God, you betcha. All right, so here's some uh, kind of uh, tidbits for cantors. We're moving on here. So cantors should select their opening hymn in advance and be ready to start singing as soon as the Iconostas doors open. Um, and this is one that I struggle with because usually my kids are asking me a million questions and I can't quite get organized. But optimally, we, we, uh, we hope for this, that we are ready to roll. Overlap with the clergy. Now, this is an important Melanie, thing. Yep. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we're still yep. seeing the YouTube screen. Oh, okay. Yep. Let me, uh, let me figure out how to do this. I think I have to stop and then redo it again. Thanks for telling me that. Okay. Does that look better? Yeah. Okay. So as I said, we cantors hope to be ready in advance of the liturgy uh, so that as soon as the Iconostas opens, we're, we're, we're ready with our opening hymn. Overlap with the clergy. Now, this is an important thing um, that maybe some of you are, are well-versed with and maybe others are not. As I mentioned when we were talking about sound, um, that we hope that there's little to no silence in our liturgies, right? And even that gets you know, taken to that level where we want there to be overlap between when the clergy is you know, at the end of, of their uh, petitions and we come in with our responses. That antiphony um, should be seamless. So I encourage you as cantors to make sure that you have that um, kind of like important kind of, you know, aggression is, is a bad word, but just to be, to have that readiness, to make sure that there's not a, a wait between when the clergy finishes and when you start to sing. Um, it should be that continuous, beautiful dialogue uh, between um, you leading the congregation as, as a cantor and a leader and the clergy. And, you know, the clergy would come back in as you're still holding those final notes as well, so that there is a continuous blanket of sound going on. We want to keep a good tempo throughout the liturgy, and we uh, must be slightly ahead of the congregation. If we don't lead, then we start to fall behind very quickly, and it starts to become a very slow divine liturgy. Um, you're not really singing with the congregation, you're leading the congregation. And that has a very important uh, kind of role with respect to keeping the tempo of the divine liturgy. You always have to be slightly ahead, slightly ahead to encourage them not to drag and to keep what we call like a good tempo for singing. Um, so that, you know, that, that prayerful aspect remains. It doesn't become, you know, very kind of bogged down, so to speak. We should be ready to change the key when necessary so that the liturgy is high enough and upbeat, but not too high so that it remains within the realms of congregational singing. Now, um, absolutely, you take your note from the priest. What the priest gives you, you respond in that same key, right? Um, but there are uh, a few instances where you do need to lower it for the sake of the congregation. Um, so let's say it's a version of the true big hymn or something like that, that goes quite high. And, you know, your priest has intoned it very high. What you might want to do is sing that opening Amin in the same key that he's in, and then be prepared to take it down a third or whatever needs to happen. So that it stays within what we call the realms of congregational singing, the abilities of a congregational um, range. Uh, and please, like I said, stop me if any of this doesn't make sense or if you have further questions with it. I have a question, Melanie. Yeah, please. Um, it's Arisha. Um, about the key change. I know that this was an issue uh, our parish dealt with for a bit that 
um, if there were two priests celebrating the liturgy and they sang yeah. very different keys, um, <sighs> so much so that they were not, um, it was very difficult to change the keys. So uh, I think for, for the congregation, it can be distracting to constantly have to change between keys. Absolutely. Um, is there, what, what is the more acceptable thing to do to just stick with one, even though it maybe could be dissonant sounding or yeah. change? That's a tough call, you know, and let's say that you have, let's say a deacon and a priest or something like that. The deacon has the majority of the, you know, of the, of the work in terms of singing. Um, so I would stick with that, you know, and those little interjections by, you know, a priest or a bishop or whatever it might be. Um, hopefully you can kind of do it in such a way that the deacon will come back to your key and you'll maintain that and those little excursions um hopefully everybody can deal with it no matter which way it's not ideal right it's not ideal because you're fighting because it's in a different key um and it sounds weird uh but like you said it can be a real chore to be constantly taking the congregation up and down and up and down and up and down so you know it's a judgment call um but the person, there's always a main celebrant, right? Or the person who has the majority of the, of the liturgy and then the, that co-celebrant has less. So you would hope that you would at least stick with that main key instead of making that co-celebrant's key the, the key that you're hoping to go to. I know there's, there's a lot of challenges. There's a, a, a priest at St. Joseph that, um, and he really struggles with singing and often I can't even like figure out a key from when he intones something because it's almost like half spoken half half sung and boy is that challenging and it I like I say it's a judgment call um but I understand where you're coming from to try not to disturb the congregation too much by going up and down constantly so you know use your use your wisdom and your common sense and I don't know if that helps you much it does yeah Yep. Yeah, thank you. yeah, I think that that's kind of uh, the best uh, advice I can give to you. Okay, Any thank you. Yeah, anything else, folks? We're good. And Marcia, make sure that you tell me when we're when we're uh, I've expired for today. Um, I'll go on just with a few more things, but uh, sure. pull me off yeah. when you need to. So um, we're coming to the end of the scheduled time. Um, but we kind of planned it so that if we overlap, or if we went over a little bit, we'd still just come to the hour. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, and I don't know how folks are feeling. If if you have a few more minutes to stay on, we're okay to, to yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, I'll I'll kind of plan it so that we end with a little bit of singing here, hopefully. So the great litany, the divine liturgy begins with the priest making the sign of the cross with the gospel book and proclaiming blessed be the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is the destination of every divine liturgy and the goal of our life. So it's like a mini, a miniature of our life, right? We're, we're hoping to reach that kingdom. And the divine liturgy should give us that beautiful glimpse. Um, it should give us that, uh, that path, that destination. Now, the great litany is a universal prayer for the needs of humankind. The church's prayer for the world. We pray for peace. We pray for well-being of our country and for creation. The response to each petition, as we know, is Lord have mercy, showing that the answer to our prayers depends not on our own merits or the power of our supplications, but upon, upon God's mercy and grace. The words, Lord have mercy, or hospite pumilo, echo the pleas of the blind man in Jericho and the lepers whom Jesus cured because of their faith. Now, antiphons are often um, a source of challenge uh, for, um, you know, cantors. There's, a, there's some questions, um, obviously, that we might have with them. My first question for you is, how many antiphons are there within the Divine Liturgy? There are three technically, but only two are used now. Yeah, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you've never thought about this, but... Where's number two? I've questioned that for, for many years. Like, why do we go from one to three, right? That's the bishop. And, and, and number two exists. It definitely exists. And we're going to sing a number two just to end <clears throat> today. Um, but technically, there are three antiphons. And I'm not too sure, and Father Roman might have a better sense of this. Like, when was that number two taken out 
Uh, when was the Divine Liturgy abbreviated to that extent? In the, during Second Vatican Council, after Second Vatican Council, uh, the Ukrainian bishops decided that they had to streamline the service. Okay. So not only did we lose the second antiphon, we lost some of the litanies that are in the church, in, in the divine liturgy. Oh, wow. Okay. So, well, and, but we still take the, uh, after the first antiphon, when we go to Yedenorodni Sinu, yep. that's, that was, that's part of second antiphon that was moved up to the first antiphon. Okay. Interesting. So antiphons are, consist of psalm verses with a refrain. And the refrains reference the mother of God, as you know, we say through the prayers of the mother of God, O Savior, save us. And the saints, they reference the saints as well as we say, son of God, wonderful in the saints, save us who sing to you, alleluia, which helps to unite ourselves with those who have already accomplished this journey of salvation, this journey to the kingdom. So the prayer before the first antiphon, the, the, you, the, little, the prayer that the priest uh, proclaims beautifully expressed expresses how God's power, it's beyond comparison, his glory is beyond comprehension, his mercy is beyond measure, and his love for us is beyond expression. The prayer before the third antiphon asks God to grant the requests of two or three who join their voices in your name. Now, there's a lot of uh, different scenarios for antiphons a lot of questions that we have if it's a sunday what are my choices if it's a sunday after easter what should i take if it's a weekday um what do i take is saturday a weekday all these questions that we have to ask ourselves as candidates <coughs> figure out and then we have feast days that have specific things to the feast, right? And I think that because this is a very like kind of a complicated thing that we need to take some time with, we'll start with this next time. But to end today, we have to end in song because I think it's a sin not to. So those of you who have the handouts, and if you don't have the handouts, if there's somebody, just let me know and I'll put it up on my screen. Let's sing. A second antiphon so that you at least know what the text of it is um father peter babe who's uh, my pastor at at saint josephite cathedral is very hopeful that the second antiphon is making a return i don't know if father Roman is as hopeful but regardless if we think that it's going to come back to the divine liturgy us as singers the first phrase of it the first sentence of it speaks to me and i think it's a wonderful way for us to end today. Um, are there those who don't have this music in front of them that they want me to find it on my computer to bring up? Page five. Yeah, page five. What time did you actually start? 3.30 Edmonton time, 5.30 Ottawa time, or Ontario time, and uh, 6.30 in Cape Breton. <laughs> so what time did we start here? Where's here? Sorry, who's speaking? Yeah, uh, Dwayne in Edmonton. 3.30. Because I don't get home till 4, 4.30. So I miss most of it. That's why it's recorded. Good. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Is anybody <laughs> needing me to find page five for them? Do you want me to post it up? That would be nice. That would okay. be nice. Sounds good. Thanks, Matthew. Just hold on. I'll stop sharing this and I'll find it for you. Give me a moment. So I take it next week is going to be recorded as well. You got it. Okay. Okay. Then I don't have to rush home like crazy from whatever I'm doing on Thursday working. Sounds good. So okay. I have the music up on my screen. Can everybody see second on antiphon, Kevin? Yeah. Yes, we're good? Yeah. Now this is, I hate asking this of you, um, but you'll have to mute yourselves so that we can sing together. Isn't that like the biggest uh, oxymoron you've ever heard in your life? Um, so you'll have to mute yourself so that we can hopefully sing together with me as I lead you. So I will lead you as best as I can here. Mm, there's our note. 
So there's the text of a second antiphon. And if um, there isn't a more beautiful phrase than praise the Lord, O my soul, in my life, I will praise the Lord. I will sing to my God as long as I last. That's something that, you know, um, maybe would be like my... Uh, my epitaph or something for life um, and I hope it might be for yours as well that you will sing to the Lord as long as you live now I know that uh, we just kind of got the juices going and the and things flowing today and I intend to take you through the entire divine liturgy um, so if you're able to join us next Thursday please come back and I promise that uh, there will be uh, much more shared and much more singing that will happen. And uh, if there's only new people in our midst, we will take some time to introduce those new people, but we're gonna be uh, running as soon as we get going uh, next week. So please join us if you're able to. And I just wanna say thank you for uh, being with us today. And uh, yeah, if you have questions, now is a great time. So uh, any questions that anybody has? Two questions, if I may. Yep. Uh, am I muted? No, I'm not. Okay. So First of all, is, is your hymnal book still available for sale? Oh, that's a big question right now. So here's the thing. Um, I just had an email like a few days ago from uh, Father Greg Zubach, who wants 25 copies. And we don't have any more at the parish, like at the uh, pastoral office here in Edmonton. But Father, our Bishop David said, Put on an email to all the priests. I'm sure they have like extra boxes here and there that we could give at least to fulfill that order. So that's uh, where we're at. We are in the process of hopefully creating a second edition. So that's why we're not ordering more copies. But if we do feel right now that there is a significant need, because it's not like the second edition will be ready tomorrow. It'll probably be ready about a year and a half from now. So if there's such a need in parishes that they need something, then just email me and we'll try to work it out either by gathering some in the meantime um, or trying to fill orders that way or just printing a small version until we have the chance to get that second edition going. And the second question, the work that you're doing now, the bilingual text and music, yep. will that include transliteration as well or just Ukrainian yep. and English text? Yeah. Thanks for asking, because we're really close to finishing that major publication on the Divine Liturgy. Right now, it's around 300 pages, if you can believe, because it has a very extensive mm -hmm. appendix, like multiple versions of major parts of the liturgy. On the left-hand page, if you're looking at the book, is the Ukrainian with transliteration. On the right-hand page is the English. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's a really great resource, and I hope to share it with all of you as soon as we can complete it here in Edmonton. Thank you, Father Roman, for those really important questions. And um, Can I I'll make note a that I, I, yeah, I, I, is there another a time for Dwayne another here. question, Melanie? Just yeah, a second. Yeah, Dwayne. Dwayne here from Edmonton, Eparchy. Uh, if you need extra books, why not get them printed and coil bind them instead of like, having them hard bound? Yeah, I don't know. I'll, uh, I'll obviously talk to the Chancery Office about that. It's, yeah. it, it's just under 500 pages. So I don't know if a coil bound book is an option for something that size. I'm not too Could sure. Could you not split it in, in two, in, into oh. two? Yeah, I'm not too sure, but I'll look into it, Dwayne. Thank you. Yeah. So um, not wanting to take much more of your time tonight as we've gone a little bit over, but that this is really wonderful, Melanie. Thank you so much. And wanting to invite everyone back next week. And um, let me just say, and Melanie, that I hope none of us need that epitaph, at least before we gather again. <laughs> to, 
Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Same time, same place. So that's 6.30 p.m. Atlantic and 5.30 New York, Toronto, Ontario, Pennsylvania. I think there are a few other places there. And 3.30 where Melanie and Dwayne are in, um, in Edmonton. Thank you very much.